My name's Chris, and I repair my own audio equipment, and I also show you how to repair yours. So let's get started. Not every piece of equipment that I have is in mint condition, but I treat each of them with respect. Each of them can still continue on for decades, even if they will never look like new pieces of equipment. And I treat all of my equipment the same way. The Pioneer SX550 may not be as powerful as my SX1980, but it's got something the 1980 doesn't have, and that is Wi-Fi. Join me as I take you through the repair, the restoration, and the modification of this amazing little Pioneer SX550. haven't already, please subscribe. Now that I've got it unpacked, I'll take a look at the unit. I'll look at the front of it. I'll look at the back of it. I'll look at every part that I can. If I can pick it up, I'll pick it up. In this one's case, it's light enough, I can pick it up. So I can look everywhere and see if I see anything obvious that would prevent me from powering up the unit. Many times I don't find anything like this, but I have a few times and I'm glad I looked it over before I decided to power it up. Now the only thing I see after taking the cover off is there's a fuse down here in the bottom. You may be able to see it, you may not. And this isn't a big deal, but there's a white wire that I can see that's actually down in the fuse holder itself. You know, so the fuse is over the top of the wire. That's one of those things, could it have always been that way? Yeah, it could have, could have left the factory like that. It's very possible. Or it blew a fuse, and somebody put a fuse in and just wasn't careful to make sure the wires were out of the way. So I'm just gonna pop that fuse and move that wire out of the way and I really don't see anything else here that concerns me. So next, I went ahead and I removed the bottom cover. Again, you never know what you're gonna find. I've found screws loose, I've found wires loose over the years, so I found it always best to take just those few minutes, go ahead, take the bottom cover off, and see if I see anything wrong down there. Now I'm ready to power up the 550 for the first time. A common issue with the Pioneer SX550, as well as other units, is the power switch. Watch these bulbs, the dial lamp bulbs, as I turn on the power switch. Look at them flicker. Hope you guys can see that flickering. They're flickering, they're flick, and then all of a sudden they go bright. Well, that's an issue with the power switch, and I'm going to show you guys how to repair that. Getting to the switch is a little bit of a pain. You have to remove the face plate, which is not that difficult, but that still doesn't get you to the power switch. You have to pretty much disassemble the front of the unit to be able to get access to that switch, because without doing that, there's just no way to get it out of the chassis. As I've spoke to you guys in the past, my desoldering tool, what a lifesaver. That's all I can say. If you ever do this regularly, you will obtain one of these devices because it makes unsoldering these pins so easy. You don't have to be a genius. You just put that hot gun right there and push a button and it just cleans the solder right out of those holes in a way that is very difficult if you don't have one of these type of guns. You can also use a solder sucker to remove the solder, or you can also use solder wick, but neither of these methods are my preferred method. I also prefer a washing machine to do my laundry. 
So with the pins unsoldered, I'm able to reach in from the top and work that power switch out of there. It's a little bit tight in here. That power transformer doesn't move. So it's a little bit tight and you've got to pass the tuner string, but it's not too difficult and you're able to work it right out of there and then I can work on it down on the test bench and take it apart. There's a couple small nuts that you have to remove on the back of the switch to be able to open it and these come loose quite easily with a pair of needle nose pliers. You've just got to take those off along with a metal bar and a couple small washers. I've taken a similar switch apart and I know there's nothing to really worry about of it falling apart when I open it, but you should always use caution when opening a switch because sometimes you'll get a surprise. With the nuts removed, the switch just slides right on off and now I'll be able to open it up and clean those contacts that are causing the issue. So you've got to do a little bit of loosening to get it apart. It's just press fitted together. And like anything you're taking apart, just take it slow, take it easy. You may need to put a screwdriver in there a little bit and help it out. But just take your time and get it open. And then you'll be able to clean that contact up and get that carbon and the other stuff that's built up over years of arcing cleaned up. And this switch will probably work for many more years before it has an issue again. A little bit of fine grade sandpaper will work out just fine. There's only one contact in the switch. You'll easily see it. It's a little bit spring loaded. And just pull that switch apart a little bit and put a little piece of sandpaper down in there. It really isn't critical what grit you use. Just anything in there. Get that carbon out of there. And then use a little bit of alcohol or a little bit of deoxid or whatever you've got on that contact just to clean up the, the grit you're going to leave behind from that sandpaper. And I've done this before on a Lafayette receiver and the power switch has worked for years. It's been fine. Doesn't mean it's always going to work forever, but it's a lot better having a working power switch than no power switch at all and you having to power it off a power strip or some other method. After getting the contact cleaned up, I went ahead and reassembled the switch assembly. And then I'm going to now put it back into the chassis, get it soldered in, and give it a try. I went ahead and I turned on the SX550 and the lights were nice, bright, and steady. All that flickering was gone. So that repaired it. And this is one of those parts that are hard to come by. I tell you guys, most of the time you can get parts for this equipment and you can, but an item like this power switch, you can't buy from Mauser or DigiKey. Now with the power switch repaired, I'm able to move on with this repair and restoration of this RX 550. Like I always do, I go through and I see what works and what doesn't. I hook up a turntable, a CD player, etc., and just see what's operating, what isn't. All the inputs seem to work fine, but you had that intermittent channel left or right coming and going no matter the input. You guys have seen it before. It's those dirty controls that cause these issues and they can be very intermittent and that's what I had. I could try various controls and I'd get various results. The left channel would go away, the right channel would come back, the right channel would go away, the left channel would come back. Sometimes I had them both, sometimes I had neither. And you guys know what that's all about. So I've got to use some deoxid on those controls. Before I show you how to clean the controls in this 550, I want to go on a little bit of a rant about deoxid. Now let me tell you a little bit about deoxid. D5 and the different cans. This can is a newer can that has this big head on it and this big yellow straw. Easy to identify compared to the old one that has an adjustable spray, low, medium, and high, and a little thin straw. Pretty easy to tell them if you see them. Don't buy this one. Don't buy the new one, the yellow one. Oh, what garbage. It, it really is truly garbage. Not, not the product, the can, the type of can it is. This thing 
sprays enough deoxid every time you push it to clean 50 potentiometers. It's ridiculous. And makes a mess all over the place. It's just terrible. And this thing here, this yellow piece that comes out, it's barely flexible at all. And you'll see though, I do have a use for this. I, I still use it. You may be able to notice, I don't know how well you can notice. You see, I've got one of the red straws inserted in the yellow straw. And can you see there's a bend in it? Well, it didn't come that way. I did that. And what this one does have one advantage in is you can get in further. If you can see this, I don't know if you can tell. See, this has got a big head on it. So really where this straw starts, I have to move this one a little bit forward. Where this straw starts, you've got a couple extra inches in this crummy can I hate. So it does have its purposes, but for the most part, get the D5, get the old one with the adjustable spray, low, medium, high, and you just need low. I wish they had ultra low. They don't, because all you need is a little bit of this, and then a lot of working of the controls, and you'll be set to go. Now, later on here, I'm going to show you about this curve in this, in this tube. It didn't come that way. I did that. So I'm going to show you that further ahead. But that's just a little bit of a rant. Don't buy this. Don't give $5 for this. Don't take two for 10. Just don't. Don't buy this. Don't buy it. Don't buy it. Buy this one. This one with the little straw adjustable heads. And these are still available on eBay. Now I went to Deoxit's website. I don't see these, the old ones anymore. All I see in their product line are these crummy ones. Simon agrees, get the deoxit in the old can. When cleaning the controls with deoxit and many pieces of vintage audio equipment, you have to remove the assemblies to be able to get to those potentiometers on the switches. There's just no way to get to them easily. In a smaller piece of equipment like this 550, it is possible to clean the controls without having to disassemble the entire unit. It's smaller, it's less packed in, and there's a little bit more room to get that deox straw into the controls so you can clean them. Some of the controls in this unit, as well as in other pieces of vintage audio equipment, the controls, the open parts, like on these potentiometers, they point up and it makes it much easier to get the deoxit straw into that control and to be able to clean it. But on some of the controls, like this potentiometer, it's closed at the top, unlike the other one that was open. And so you have to get that deox straw underneath the switch to clean it properly. Could you spray deoxid on the top part of this switch and have it go in? Maybe get some of it in there, but you're not going to clean it well. You've got to get that deoxid straw under this potentiometer where the case is open so you can get most of the deoxid into the switch and not all over your case. I showed earlier a bent straw and I was going to tell you guys how I went and did that. I, I bent mine with a heat gun and it bends it nice and even and you can do it pretty precisely. Now if you don't have a heat gun or some other device to heat up a piece of plastic to bend it, you can just bend it by hand. Now it's not going to be as neat. You're going to have some creases in it, but it's going to work just as well. Also, just stick a piece of paper towel, napkin, something down in the chassis when you're spraying this deoxid. It's not going to do any harm if it goes somewhere other than in the control that you're trying to clean. But it can get a little bit messy and it's a pretty good dirt collector over time. So it's just best to try to collect most of it in a paper towel or napkin instead of having it all over your chassis. I mentioned earlier that I, this unit has all types of flaky issues as far as the controls go. And that's pretty much par for the course with vintage audio equipment. And one of the leading causes are the push button switches. And I found out that as I pushed these buttons, whether it was the loudness button, the tape monitor button, I could get almost an endless variety of combinations of things not working right. The left channel would disappear, the right channel would disappear, one channel would be high or low. 
and the issue with these is there's a little bit more of a problem cleaning these and many times you have to take at least the face plate off to get to them because you want to spray right up inside that switch. These aren't sealed. If you take a look at one of these controls right by the blue buttons, there's a spring. And if you can get your deoxit straw up in there, you're going to get enough spray up into that switch to be able to clean it. And then you'll have to exercise it 20, 30, 40, 50 times and it'll clean it. If you don't take the faceplate off, it's very difficult to get the deoxit down in there. You can take them apart too, but there's usually no need to do that. And really, it, you'll know if whatever you're doing's working, because if your intermittent problems are gone, whatever you did worked. And if your intermittent problems aren't gone, well, whatever you did didn't work, and you're gonna have to do something else. But bottom line, 99.9% .9 of the time, if you've got intermittent issues, and you're pushing the buttons and working your controls and you keep getting different results you've got a control or multiple controls in that unit that need to be cleaned properly another common issue with vintage audio equipment is most of the time you've got some burned out bulbs in this unit all of the dial lamp bulbs were good the stereo bulb was good, but the power bulb was burned out. So I replaced that with an LED, and I normally always replace the indicator lights like the power or the stereo light with an LED. Now the dial lamps, I'm kind of a toss up. I may put LEDs in it. If I don't like the way it looks, I'll put the normal bulbs right back in it again. So you can just use whatever you like. It's really a preference thing. Uh, they're easy to change out. And so if you do go and buy some LEDs and you don't like them, you can just go ahead and replace them without too much difficulty in most units. I'm going to check the DC offset on this SX550. And you guys can do this at home with your receiver or amplifier. It's a good idea. You just need a little inexpensive digital multimeter like I have set up here. This was inexpensive. I bought it on eBay. But I'm telling you, it works fine. So if you've got anything like this, uh, this is really all you need to do this. I've put the two probes into the um, right speaker output right here at the back where you normally hook your speaker wires, positive and negative they just go in there right now the 550s off so you just see the meter kind of getting some random random noise but i'm going to go ahead and turn it on here at the front and we're going to see uh how much dc offset we've got so here we go and probably saw the light come on maybe and we're waiting for the amp to go ahead power up and it has and you see it, it pops around a little bit here in the beginning and that's normal they're going to vary somewhat especially before they warm up but i can tell you right now that probably even after these few seconds it's probably going to be acceptable it's about 22 22 and a half uh, millivolts which is good anything under 50 millivolts or so I really wouldn't worry about it if you guys at home or have your receiver or your amplifier with 50 millivolts I wouldn't even mess with it you can and I do sometimes but that can be a, a rabbit's hole you start messing with that and depending how long you leave the amplifier on uh, it can vary quite a bit but usually you want to leave your amp on or your receiver like this one 15 minutes or so to get a good idea but a lot of time you'll get a pretty good idea within just a few seconds where you're going to end up at and this one looks like it's going to be fine the right channel's dc offset was fine but not so with the left channel it was very erratic Sometimes it would be minus 100 millivolts, sometimes positive 100 millivolts, and somewhere in between just bouncing around. But I've seen that before, and I'm pretty sure I know what the issue is. There's no trim pot to adjust DC offset in this receiver. What they use is an input differential pair, and that should normally, under most circumstances, keep the DC offset under 20 30 millivolts but i've found over the years the 2sa 798 transistor which is a two section transistor those fail in one manner or the other this particular one didn't totally fail but over time 
those transistors where it's so important for their gain to be exactly the same it starts to change over the years I've had some of these just go bad I mean they're flat out bad but most of them their gains change internally and there's nothing you can do about that except to replace them uh, fortunately it's an easy and cheap replacement you can use two 2SA992 transistors to make the equivalent transistor the 2SA798 and that's what I've done here I've taken two 2SA992 transistors and combined them to replace that bad 2SA798 transistor I've also gain match both of the new transistors that's very important to gain match them in some manner I do it with an Atlas DCA Pro and that's a device that many of you guys aren't gonna have so when I say it's inexpensive and easy it is when you've got the right tool now with the bad transistor replaced, the DC offset on the left channel is now reading just about what the right channel did between 20-25 millivolts. When I got all the issues behind me with this 550, I thought this would be a great little receiver to put Bluetooth in. And I also thought for you guys that are listening, what a perfect little receiver for the garage, the basement, the man cave, wherever. This little receiver sounds great, it looks great, and you could have the latest technology in it. You could be in there streaming your Bluetooth stuff. But I also didn't want to put an add-on box onto it. I didn't want it to lose the auxiliary port, even if you weren't going to use the auxiliary port. I didn't want to plug something into it and just have something sitting on top of it or somewhere with little antennas. I wanted this receiver to look stock. Like it doesn't have Bluetooth, just like it came out of the box from Pioneer in 1977. And for me to do that, I was going to have to do some work inside the chassis. I'm going to show what I did in this 550, but it doesn't matter the brand you have or what model receiver that you have. It can be a Techniques, a Sansui, a Kenwood, whatever it is, this mod you could do to your receiver at home. And I found a little 4.2 Bluetooth card on Amazon for $12.99. There was no reason I picked this one over any other one. There's a ton of them available. I didn't think I needed a 5.0 Bluetooth receiver. I thought the 4.2 would be fine. So that's what I went with. So before I go very far here, I'm gonna just temporarily attempt to hook up the Bluetooth to the receiver and just run some wires outside the uh, chassis and see if I can get it going. What I'm going to do, I think, after looking at the schematic, I'm going to just use the tuner voltage uh, that's built into the receiver that goes from the power supply to the tuner. It's supposed to be about 13.7 volts. I don't really know what it is. I'll measure it and see. Now the input to this is stated at 5 to 12 volts. So that's a little bit high, not terribly high. It'll probably handle it. And another thing I found interesting uh, in the paperwork that came with this Bluetooth module is that they give you they don't give you a whole lot of information actually they don't give you a, a whole lot of details but one thing they do tell you here is that the LDO chip can withstand voltage up to 35 volts so even though the inputs 5 to 12 let's give it a try see what happens on the Bluetooth board there is a couple spring clips where I've installed 22 gauge wire and then I'll run that down to the chassis to grab the tuner voltage so now I'm gonna just use some of my little my little test clips it's a ground right here pin 33 and 13.7 is here on 32 make sure those are on there well they seem to be on there good but you can see I've just got got some very long wires running here right now 
I just wanted to have them long enough. I will, I'll probably for sure have to cut them down if I go to install this thing. But right now they're just hanging here outside the chassis, make everything easy on me. So let's give it a try and see if uh, this little Bluetooth module will uh, communicate with something. I'm going to give it a try here. I got my phone ready in case it works. Here I'm going to just try to connect to it. Right now I've got the receiver off. I'm going to try to get this guy in a position so we can both see what happens when I turn it on. Make sure I don't short something out here, which can happen when you got stuff just dangling around. I look all right. I'll kind of put it like this. Maybe you can see it. So here I go with the... Uh, I'm going to turn on the SX550 now. Let's see what happens. Oh, yes. I can see the fast blue. And now it went solid blue. Connected. So, it found my iPhone. Let's see. I'm trying to hold on to this so I don't short something together. Let's see. Settings. Bluetooth. Yep. It has here uh, Drock underscore BT. And this is the name of it. So I got to assume this is it. And right here on my iPhone, it says it's connected. So now the next step is to hook up the audio outputs to the receiver in some manner. So now I've got the bottom cover of the SX550 off because I want to get to the auxiliary RCA connectors. And what I'm going to do, well, first of all, what comes with this little board are audio cables. So you've got a left, a right, and a ground in this little cable. And the connector goes right into the board. And they have one that's marked out, the other one's marked auxiliary. So I'll go ahead and just put this one into out. Put it in right. All right. Snaps right in. So I'll use him. Now, of course, we got the issue. What are we going to do when we've got this type of a connector and you've got RCA plugs? Well, again, I'm going to just temporarily hook this up and give it a try and make sure it works before I worry about how am I going to mount this thing and connect everything. I'm just going to use the same 22 gauge solid wire that I used to hook the power up with to hook up to the audio out connector and to go ahead and temporarily solder that onto the bottom of the chassis at the auxiliary port. I got the Bluetooth card all wired in to the auxiliary port under the chassis. I went ahead and turned on the 550 and here's what I heard from the Bluetooth receiver when I first turned it on and started to turn up the volume control. Now I'm only sitting a couple feet from my test bench speakers, but that was a very unusual sound that I've never heard before from a piece of vintage audio equipment. This noise actually wasn't a big surprise to me because I did a little bit of research before I started this project and it seemed like many folks in different applications were having issues with noise with their Bluetooth receiver, especially when you were powering the Bluetooth receiver off the same power source that you were trying to add the Bluetooth receiver into. In my case, that's what I wanted to do. I didn't want to run a separate power supply, and it seemed like, again, most people, if you run a separate power supply to this Bluetooth receiver, it can greatly reduce or eliminate the noise that you may have. Most of these noise issues that folks are having, like myself, seem to be ground loop issues. And one way that many people have eliminated the problem is by putting extra capacitance on the input to the Bluetooth receiver. In my case, I'm jumpering off the FM tuner voltage. So what I did is to put an electrolytic capacitor at the input of my Bluetooth receiver. I ended up using a thousand microfarad. I think it's a little bit big, but I had one, so I used it. And what do you know? I had no more noise. It was nice and quiet. So for me, that was the fix, to put some capacitance 
at the power input of the Bluetooth receiver. Some other folks say it doesn't work or it didn't help them. They had to do different things with coupling capacitors or changing the routing of the ground or power leads to the Bluetooth receiver. With the Bluetooth audio sounding good now, now it's time for me to figure out how to mount all of this equipment. Mount that extra capacitor and mount the Bluetooth assembly inside the receiver along with figuring out what to do with the wiring. Whenever I do a modification like this, I like to make some sort of a mechanical connection with whatever I'm putting in to a piece of vintage audio equipment. I'm not real crazy about using just tape. I'm not real crazy about using just tie wraps to hold something on. Sometimes you've got to use those, but I'll exhaust all other methods before I'll use either of those exclusively anyway. So I'll start with the capacitor. Where I ended up mounting it was right with the two filter capacitors in this 550. There's a clamp there that's used to hold the two stock filter capacitors, but also it's a great space to put a clamp for this smaller capacitor. And there's a screw that goes through the clamp that holds the two filter capacitors. I was able to put a plastic clamp on the other side of it and use a nylon nut to screw onto it to hold it on and that worked great. The capacitor now is nice and secure but you shouldn't leave exposed leads like shown here in the picture. So what I did I had to wire up this capacitor. It's going to be wired down to the tuner voltage. And after I installed the wires, I soldered wires, I twisted wires around the legs of the capacitor. Then I used a piece of heat shrink tubing and I put that around the exposed leads. So if something ever did happen, if it ever did come loose, somebody else is working on it, you're not going to end up having a a problem because you've got exposed leads. So now I had to find a spot for the Bluetooth board. Initially I thought underneath the chassis might be a good spot and I tried different spots. I moved it around. I thought maybe here, maybe there, but there just was not enough clearance under this chassis to be able to get the bottom plate on and have the Bluetooth card under the chassis. So I said, forget it, it's not gonna fit under here. So it was time to go to the top of the chassis. So I've got the 550 back down flat here. I'm gonna look at the top and see where I can mount it. As I mentioned, I try to avoid drilling more holes in any of the equipment when I do some sort of modification like this. Sometimes you got to. I mean, you have no choice, but I'll exhaust every option before I do that. And what I noticed here is a possibility. First I saw the turntable ground here and I thought well I could go on that but that wouldn't be very bright would it to try to mount it because you got to turn the uh, you got to be able to turn the lug here when you hook up your turntable so that wouldn't be real bright. And right here at the back is a chassis screw. And you may be able to see that right here where my finger is. And what I think I can do is this board has four mounting holes. And like most modern electronics, this thing weighs all of a gram. And that may be pushing it. You know, it weighs nothing. So my thought is to put... this board over one of these ground screws and then get a small nut and I got a little thing here one of these you know you buy a ton of parts in a plastic box for five dollar things and I think I've got some M1 nuts I think that's what it is or an M2 screw whatever something metric in here that I can probably hook this on with and what I'll do also is to put some sort of a spacer in here to keep it off the chassis, even though, interesting enough, on this board, whether you can see much of this, 
you see that there's four mounting holes and I used my meter and these aren't going to ground or anything they're just mounting holes they're not grounded or anything and on the back of this board you see there's not really much exposed there's a very small little point here which is actually for the external antenna for this little Bluetooth unit I can see that exposed and I can see some exposed metal up here by this USB power connector that I'm not using but that's the only thing I see on the back the rest of this does not appear to be conductive now with that being said I still will give this a little bit of a space here I've got to find a way to space this out just a hair and this ground and this bracket here which you probably can't see that well there's a bracket here that the screw goes into that makes the ch the chassis rigid that one screw will and a nut a washer and a nut will hold this in place fine it's never going to go anywhere and I'll use some sort of a spacer here I, I, I like to use some sort of a mechanical connection you know you could use double-sided tape here you could use tie wrap in some manner to hold it on that would be fine but I think this is its spot right here at the top now this is the Bluetooth antenna you probably can't see that all that well but this looks like little lines of copper running it's right here at the top and so I'll put this at the top of the chassis I'm thinking well maybe I'll get a little better reception who knows maybe not I'm not going to use an external antenna but we'll see how it uh, how it works once I get it all wired in I tell you I, f I end up spending as much time deciding how I want to modify something and I probably do modifying it I'm almost sure I do because I want it to look as neat as possible it'll never look like an OEM product but I want to put everything back in neatly and it, or as neat as neatly as I can and sometimes it takes a little bit of time to think about how am I going to route these new wires and cables to make it look its best it's not going to make it operate any different i could just throw the whole thing together frankly and uh it'd work you know wires all over the place but that's just not my style i guess i finally settled on a way to run the wires up through the chassis i tried a couple different ways it wasn't too difficult as i indicated earlier there were several different spots i could run them up through and i picked the best ones to make the insulation neat I used a spot near the rear of the chassis where they ran the antenna leads and I went ahead and ran my audio leads right through there and I finished it off with a few tie wraps again just to give it a more professional appearance. With the Bluetooth receiver up and connected to my iPhone it was time to give it a try and listen to it a little bit and to see what it sounded like and it's great with the phone because now you've got yourself a little bit of a remote volume control don't you so you really don't have to go up to the 550 to change the volume you can just do it right there on your phone if you'd like to i ran the 550 through its paces on the test bench it did great one wonderful thing about vintage audio equipment even though this was a lower priced unit at its time it still was engineered and built in a manner that it's lasted all of these years and you don't have to own the top end to still get a quality product at least back in 1977 that's the way things were built so i think this is just an ideal little receiver for a lot of people it may be a second or third receiver for you guys who are into the hobby and you want one as i mentioned before for the garage or for a bedroom what have you but using this receiver as your first receiver in a vintage audio system it's not going to embarrass you it's got enough power for most people if you get a pair of efficient speakers and it sounds good you're really not giving up much with this 550 it's really a quality product it was a lot of fun for me to work on don't forget to give me a thumbs up and for you guys who aren't subscribers please hit that subscribe button for my present subscribers as always thank you so much y'all have a good day